in Florida where the people uh, mostly use shotguns for hunting, uh, the Florida militia was allowed to carry shotguns to muster. Uh, and you're technically not breaking the law because a shotgun could fire a musket ball. It just couldn't fit a bayonet. So technically, you see, the shotgun could fit in the musket category. Uh, yes, yes, they had lawyers back then too, working, uh, working these things out. On December 23, 1835, Major Francis Dade and 110 soldiers from Tampa Bay at what used to be Fort Brook decided to march north for about a week to reinforce Fort King in what's now Ocala. And basically this was because they had heard rumors of further Seminole movements and they were afraid of a general uprising. And the whole way up, they were marching through territory that started as swampland and they figured they were going to be attacked as they were crossing rivers or as they were fording rivers. So eventually, because it was cold and it was near Christmas, as Commander Dade makes it into a territory like this, which is a lot more open and you can clearly see, and his troops weren't being ambushed or at fear of being ambushed by crossing a river, because naturally that would divide their force in two, he sort of started to let his guard down. And when they arrived in specifically this area, about 180 Seminole approached and surrounded him and laid an ambush right where we're standing. A Floridian who lived among the Seminoles before the Seminole War, who signed his name as Orson, wrote a letter to a newspaper shortly after this battle. And he said that uh, the Seminoles are not armed with $2 pop guns. They were market hunters who hunted deer for a living and a significant number of them in excellent good quality rifles. However, he notes that from his own experience over the, from the 1820s on, that when he used to shoot at marks with the Seminole Warriors, a larger number of them had very indifferent guns. But considering that they hunted with them, you get to know your gun. You, you can use a smoothbore accurately once you know, you know where the ball is going to go generally. Now, the reason that this massacre went over so horribly is because they were able to maintain their secrecy up until the very last moment. In fact, the shot was given by the chief, my canopy, who sniped Dade as he was on his horseback, and then they said probably only about 10 soldiers got shots off because they let their guard down and their muskets were stored underneath their heavy winter overcoats. But the ones that did survive, if you want to follow me around, they created a sort of fort just out of a few logs, a redoubt where they kind of fell back to. And the Indians said that as they would fire off, the smoke from their muskets would make a big puff around them and, you know, obscure their area where they were uh, standing in. But as soon as the smoke went away, they would go and dispatch them. They said after this massacre, 98 regular soldiers were buried here. I think seven or eight officers were buried in the tree area behind here and these are now all buried up at uh, St. Augustine Military Cemetery and they actually found Dade's body further up this path right here. In the description of the combat specifically, when the troops had built the breastwork here, Chief Alligator says that the initial counterattack to surround the breastwork was about 10 warriors and but Private Clark who saw them coming through the woods says that he saw all of them. So what that suggests to me is that the guys with the best guns were kind of moving ahead to take good positions because Private Clark says they're very careful to position themselves around this breastwork uh, in a circle with the, radi the, the, range, uh, the radius of that circle being the range of their rifles. So you see, the musket has a lesser range than the rifle and much less accuracy. So the troops were practically powerless to expose themselves or getting riddled with bullets until they were finally finished. But the warriors were careful to remain under cover at, at coming no closer than they absolutely had to come to use their rifles to advantage, where they had rifles, you see. So this explains in part why the battle took several hours. Uh, you know, it's rather desultory to use the term. Uh, we do the battle reenactments, we have about one hour, and if we fought the, if they fought the battle the way we reenactment, the way we reenact it, 
it would have lasted 40 minutes. <laughs> but most of this combat from the descriptions are the guys laying on the ground and firing uh, as uh, targets as they presented themselves on both sides. Private Clark says that he fired three warriors. He only saw three. And even then, it was the side of their head and their elbow, and they were behind trees or brush. So they're very careful to remain undercover. Uh, the troops were trained in skirmish drill to fight undercover, too, but again, with a musket, with no sights, you're pointing. And you know, it's, it's just a, it's a big question mark if you're going to hit a man-sized target at 150 yards with the musket. They fired the cannon at all different points, smashing the trees. One of the descriptions was they were firing the solid cannon shot high to hit the tree balls and drop them. So when you have the whole tree ball dropping, it's like an area strike. Whereas the cannonball itself, you know, it's just this big. It's, it's not going to hit an individual warrior. But if you strike the treetops, you can drop the treetops down over an area. So there was one description by a soldier in the Seminole War says one of the survivors here told him that they fired the cannon high with cannonball to smash the boss and drop them to, to at least do something along those lines. The description was that the trees for one mile in the circumference were pretty smashed up and shot up with musketry and cannon fire. So they didn't go quietly. And as you can tell, the kind of movements of these officers, the actual majority of the troops killed and the redoubt were back there, up here is the monument to Lieutenant Mudge, and several of the other officers, including Major Dade, are up here. Now, all these men are currently buried in uh, St. Augustine National Cemetery. Their graves brought down there and buried under huge limestone pyramids. And uh, this massacre was overshadowed by the Alamo, which happened later that year. So it's kind of a forgotten moment in American history. This place has been called the graveyard of military empires in the 1830s because you would come here and your career would just simply come to an end. It was commanded by a long chain of people who would take control of the armies in Florida for three months, six months, a year and a half, and it was basically a rotating cycle of officers. Now, very few people survived this attack. Uh, the reenactors explained a little bit, but I think it's interesting. Private Ransom, you know, the Black Seminoles discovered him there. About 50 or 60 of them rode in, it said, after the battle and shot him and said, you know, he's dead enough. They took his clothes. And then with the help of a friendly Indian woman, he actually was able to limp to Fort King, which was unreinforced. He collapsed a mile away and she carried him the rest of the way. Now at Fort King, this whole battle, this massacre was about to commence because they wanted to wait for the arrival of the Seminole head chief, Osceola. Now he wasn't able to make it down here because he was already in an advanced party up at Fort King, killing the Indian agent who was in charge of their removal to Indian territory. So you can see this wasn't just a uh, random hit and run guerrilla rebel movement. This was very coordinated and you could consider these Seminoles a regular standing army. And the Seminoles themselves, they were not a tribe as we would consider the Cherokee or the Creek. They were a mix of all the tribes that we had already exiled to Indian territory. They had elements of Creek, they had elements of Cherokee, they had elements of slaves who had escaped from their plantations, they had Spaniards who had assimilated into their tribes, and as America tried to wrest control of Florida from them, they put up a really good fight. The Black Seminoles, yes. <clears throat> Private Clark gives several accounts to different newspapers after the battle. And he says that after the Seminole uh, overwhelmed the position here, <clears throat> he claims that he heard some of the black Seminoles speaking in English, uh, dispatching some of the wounded. Clark also says that they were talking when they shot him in the chest. One of them saying, he's darn him, he's dead enough, and then shot him again. Uh, Chief Alligator says that the black Seminoles only killed a few of the wounded. Uh, so you've got a hundred men lying around here. Uh, they're evidently, uh, while well, the press at the time referred to it as Dade's Massacre, and when you read Clark's account of him playing dead and being shot, and then some of the other wounded being killed, if you want to be technical, when Alligator says that the Black Seminoles killed three of the wounded, that would include Clark, wouldn't it? Who they shot through the chest, and obviously they thought he was dead. So they actually only killed two of the wounded. 
uh, from Alligator's account. Uh, other wounded were left in place and either died in, in place or escaped the battleground. Uh, Private Clark, of course, escaped wounded. Private de Corsi was evidently entirely unwounded, according to Clark. So you see that shows that the Seminoles and Black Seminoles were not thorough about policing the battleground. They picked up the guns. They took a lot of the clothing. The Battle of Camp Izard under General Gaines, there was some confusion where many of the Seminole warriors and Black Seminoles were wearing the forage caps and army jackets and had muskets and in the woods looked like an army unit moving through the woods caused a little confusion in action. Uh, but Private de Corsi was killed on their way back to Tampa Bay. Uh, Private Clark says that uh, while they were on the road, uh, a mounted warrior came upon them and they divided, took two directions on the road and uh, Clark says he heard a gunshot and no one ever heard from Private de Corsi again. Clark, Clark eluded detection and then continued alone to Tampa. Uh, there were two other privates of the command that survived and to give accounts of the march. Privates Thomas and Sprague, <clears throat> both of whom were credited as being wounded in action as well, uh, although less severely than Private Clark. Uh, Clark was uh, noted as coughing up pieces of his coat that had been forced oh, into his lungs dude. by the bullets wow, wow. and so forth. So he was discharged for disability pretty quickly after his hospitalization. Uh, the other two guys, once they recovered, were back in service. Uh, and uh, until the, uh, Private Thomas died of disease in Florida in 1837. And then Sprague survived in the 1840s, and he left the Army finally in about 1846, I believe, and uh, no record of him afterward. Interpreter for the command. And in the ambush, he, he hit the ground and in his various accounts, he says that some of the warriors were debating whether to kill him or not. But that finally the Seminole Chief Jumper said, don't kill him, I, he's mine, leave him alone. And then when the Seminole first withdrew after the ambush, they carried Pacheco along with them. Pacheco remained with the Seminole for a couple of years and surrendered with Jumper's band. And with, uh, General Jessup, who commanded at the time, just ordered Pacheco move, to take him west with the others. Uh, Pacheco moved back to Florida before his death late in the 19th century and he gave some interviews uh, where he was he was uh, rather disappointed to see some local history had claimed that he had led Major Dade into the ambush and he gave some interviews to explain that that's not the case that uh, everyone knew the danger uh, Major Dade though did not believe that Seminoles were going to attack and of course he was wrong <laughs> and infamously, Osceola, when he was captured by the army, we flew a white flag saying, come and, and we'll negotiate terms of surrender, and then we just captured him. So at the end of the Second Seminole War, there was no formal declaration of peace. And the war, they say, went on until the 1950s, when their remnants in the Florida Everglades were given recognition. And one last fact, America was refusing to recognize them, so they went to Fidel Castro, and Fidel Castro said, you know, maybe I'll recognize you. And America immediately said, we recognize you, you're federally recognized, and you can have your own reservations. So all it took was approaching Fidel Castro, which I guess you could say the Indian Wars and the Cold War kind of coalesced in the 1950s.